Welcome to Aloud. I'm your host, Keneal Joyce, and I'm joined today by David Schechtman, senior partner in evolution, an executive coach, and a teacher. Hi, David. Hello. We're here today to talk about self as instrument. And self as instrument is a, a, an understanding of the role that each of our unique selves plays when we are engaging with others, leading others, and helping others. And in particular, that's what we're focused on today is how can we be helpful? David, why is this topic so relevant for leaders in all ways and right now? My experience with this topic is that mastery comes from the journey of exploring self as instrument in a helping relationship, and that that is an internal journey and the work in that space is what ultimately leads to people being great at what they do. I would say that normally uh, in any kind of environment, but especially today, given what we are facing and dealing with uh, in the current situation, it is absolutely essential at this point to be in full control of how we show up, how we engage others, and the support that we're willing to offer. And the self being the instrument is the big flip here. So if you're feeling like you need more tools, you need to read more, you need more models, frameworks, uh, today's really gonna take that assumption and flip it on its head. So I think you're gonna look forward to finding out that you yourself are the most important tool in your toolkit. Welcome to the show. Today we have back on the show one of your favorite guests from everything that you've shared with me in iTunes reviews and in person. I know that you loved hearing from David Schechtman on episode 10 about the hero's journey. And I'm so excited to have my good friend David back here today on Zoom with me while we're both sheltered in place at home. For those of you who don't know David, David is a senior partner at Evolution. He's a committed executive coach. He works with CEOs, high potential leaders, successful sales professionals, and really does a lot of work focusing on mastering deep change. And these are the changes that are deeply transformational to the self that throw your head and out of whack and have you really confront the big questions that have kept you in the guardrails by not answering and, and really blows open a lot of possibility that way. I've really done a lot of work with him. I love working with him. He's extremely um, intellectually stimulating guy to me and very, very funny uh, and super smart. So a couple clients he's worked with, he's worked with Slack, uh, Electronic Arts, Coursera, Collective Health. Actually, this is not a couple. There's a lot. DeVita, Virtuoso, Elementary Robotics entrepreneur's organization. He also acts as an advisor. And besides his background in teaching at USC's Marshall School of Business and being a presenter at the OD Network Annual Conference, he's also a TEDx speaker, and he has a master's of science in OD from Pepperdine, organizational development. Finally, he is a PPC certified, International Coach Federation certified coach. Hi, David. Welcome back. Hello, Keneal. It is great to be here. Yeah, so good. So we are catching up here on Friday, April 24th is when we're recording today's podcast for you. So whatever it is that has happened in the world between April 24th at 2 p.m. Pacific time and now when you are listening, we don't know what that's going to be yet. And I like to always preface it because, you know, recording anything ahead of time these days in this era of COVID-19 uh, means that we are disconnected a little bit from the day-to-day -day unfolding of one of the world's most unifying crises. So i uh, just say that as a bit of an acknowledgement and listeners, I am hoping that you are well and uh, learning from this all that you can and that you and your loved ones are safe and taking care of each other, however remotely that may be. So today, David, you're here and you're going to talk to us about a topic that we kind of, that emerged for us in a conversation as we were chatting around what it's like to be sheltered in place, COVID-19, uh, something called self as instrument. And, uh, but before we, we get into that, I wonder if we could do a check-in and, and today's check-in, I'd love to check in you and me, but also invite you listeners to take this as an opportunity to to really listen to this question that I'm going to ask you. 
and take stock for yourself. You know, if you were here with us today, how might you respond to this check-in question? You can even pause for a moment and give yourself the time to, to really reflect and, and answer this question for yourself. It's not nothing too profound, but simply getting present and doing a check-in itself can be a pretty profound experience in my experience. So uh, what I'm wondering, David, since, yeah, since it's been I don't know, a week or so since we've caught up, I wonder if we could zoom back even further. And what's it been like to be you for, say, the last six weeks? Yes. Okay. So normally, uh, Keneal, I have a pretty standard answer to that, that I've shared with the majority of people in my life, friends and colleagues and even clients. But in this scenario, especially given the topic, I want to go a little bit deeper and uh, give you a stronger insight and take a little risk myself. Hmm. So I think the best way to explain it is through a story. And it's actually a story I have to give credit to Sam Harris for. I was listening to a podcast or maybe a teaching episode of his a couple mm-hmm. of weeks ago. And it really encapsulated how I feel or how I have felt in the last six weeks. So the story actually comes uh, from, uh, I think, 2012. It uh, was about an incident that happened in Iceland. And uh, I'll give you the short version. Uh, there was a, a tour bus that went out with, I think, 50 or so people um, out to a remote area uh, in the beautiful Icelandic countryside. Uh, and uh, the tour group pulled over and went on uh, a pretty extensive hike that took them away from the bus for a long period of time, I think most of an afternoon. And during that time, one of the tourists uh, changed clothes. She went uh, into a a restroom facility and uh, completely changed uh, her outfit, then went back to the bus and uh, took her seat uh, normally, you know, among the rest uh, of the people on the bus. And they were all prepared and ready to go. And then uh, a couple of the uh, other tourists on the bus uh, alerted uh, the staff and said, hey, there's a a woman uh, who is uh, Asian, uh, was wearing dark clothes, um, and she was here with us early. I don't see her, don't Hmm. don't know uh, where she is. And I'm concerned, you know, it seems like the numbers are about right, but we just don't recognize someone who was here earlier. Hmm. And so uh, the kind of word went around the bus and everyone expressed uh, concern uh, and some confusion, including the woman who had changed clothes. Oh my gosh. Uh, and not recognizing that uh, they were talking about her. She was the missing woman. She was the missing woman, but she was determined to find who she thought was the missing woman and not herself. So they organized a search party. They went out, uh, spent about an hour, hour and a half, uh, retracing all their footsteps where they've been looking for evidence, garments, footprints, uh, anything that would reveal her, uh, couldn't find it. I ended up calling the police. They brought in, I think, the uh, Icelandic Coast Guard, did this exhaustive search until about uh, 3.30 or 4 in the morning. So they'd been at it for eight hours plus. Wow. When she suddenly realized, oh, that's me. I'm the one who changed clothes. I'm the one that we're looking for. So the reality about how I've been in the last six weeks is I've been myself and not myself. I've been looking for someone that is already here. And I've uh, been pretty disoriented much of the time. Wow. That's a, that's a really trippy story. What a great illustration of how you've been i i guess it's time it's my turn to check in thank you david thank you welcome uh so i honestly what i can say is i am just blissful i've just been so blissful i love this version of my life that I'm getting to have right now. Um, I love spending so much time like working my little plot of land here in LA and we're sprouting some, you know, you can take the, the tip of a 
a green onion or like the hairy bottom of a regular onion, or if a, something grows kind of it grows green sprouts in your cupboard, like garlic, you can, you can take all that and you can, you can put it in water in the sun and let it, let it grow bigger and then you can plant it. And so this has been something that my kids and I have been doing. And it's these little projects that I have this, um, I don't know, pioneer instinct right now, I think is pretty widely shared. And it's, I know that I'm not going to get much food from this endeavor. Um, And who knows, once it actually goes out into our sandy soil, I don't know if any of it will live, but it's this feeling of, um, I can be effective if I just stay here on my land if I just stay here in my home and I work with what I have Mm -hmm. and I, I'm no longer doing this mental math that had become such a part of my day-to-day existence around, is this a smart thing for me to be doing with my time? Mm -hmm. Like my time is no longer my own in a certain sense because I am you know, I'm, my, my husband and I are both doing it, but I'm, I'm the primary person who's homeschooling the kids and they're home. And, and so it's not as if I'm making all these big strategic decisions about how to spend my time anymore. It's more like pick up after the dog, you know, puppy destroys things, help the kids get their food, help them get through school. And then in, in the little interim period, my brain is fairly overloaded, but I can do simple little things that feel like this miracle because I've just turned a kitchen scrap into an onion Mm. and the physical exertion of it and just the constant motion is so calming to me. And when I start feeling anxious, which I have, you know, felt more anxiety these last few weeks, I think like most people, but I just start doing little things like that. And, um, it feels like it feels it feels very much like a home, a home to me. Um, not my physical home, but in my body, it, that feels like home to me. Mm-hmm. So, thank you. That's where I am. That's yeah. great. Are you open to some feedback? Always. Yeah, I can. That's certainly- a lie. Not always, but I, from you, yes. <laughs> right now, yes. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. But who am I? Am I the person who changed clothes? <laughs> um, but. You know, hearing you say that um, has also touched um, or it resonates with some things that have touched me as well in the last few weeks, too. And that is uh, like what's real and what's important. Um, I uh, was I I can't get the whole um, scene from The Matrix uh, out of my mind, the one where Morpheus Mm -hmm. is offering Neo uh, the choice of the red or the blue pill. Uh, and thinking that um, our situation in the last six weeks has been um, a version of that. But what's different is um, we didn't choose to take the red pill. We were forced to take the red pill. And so we're all dealing with a kind of enforced hyper-reality of our current uh, circumstances and situation. Mm -hmm. And we're, um, I know I am really finding incredible beauty uh, in simple things mm-hmm. and uh, just how unbelievably uh, nourishing that is and freeing and, and liberating too at mm-hmm. the same time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 And you know, I feel like, I feel like a lucky one and I am wanting to name that. And I said, there's a little piece of, um, I don't know, guilt about that. Maybe Ign- just acknowledgement that there, there are definitely those who are struggling more right now than others. And I'm certainly one who's, you know, feeling really fortunate right now. Yeah. Yeah. So does any of this relate to our topic today? So, so often our check-ins naturally do, I'm wondering. I think so. I think so. Uh, Self as instrument is a topic that uh, is near and dear to my heart. Uh, And I think, partially because I have this masochistic attraction to esoteric topics <laughs> that, uh, no one else seems to understand very well, and partially because the enforced simplicity of our lives in the last six weeks in uh, many ways, and I think for a lot of the population, 
has forced us to really look in the mirror and see what's there. Mm. So a lot of what many of us do on a daily basis is engage in busyness and tasks and um, you know, running errands and working hard and, and just doing and going. And in circumstances like that, it's pretty easy to not have to look in the mirror or face what's there or be alone with oneself in thought. But if you're like me, a lot of the last six weeks uh, have been uh, filled with many of those opportunities. Mm. Uh, and some of what I've uh, seen or tried to see I've loved and some of what I've seen and come across I haven't. And making sense out of that really requires a structured approach, uh, personally and professionally. And making sense out of all of... Yeah, what I see. And just what you see in the world. Yeah, well, yeah. who am I? And yeah. what am I doing? And what's the value I add? And what do I hope to accomplish? All mm -hmm. of those. You know, they're kind of big. They're kind of simple, but very big questions mm -hmm. that uh, a lot of us, and I know I, am really being forced to confront right now. And my work and your work is about helping people and mm -hmm. being in that kind of relationship. And now is a time where I'm really looking close and examining what that means. Mm -hmm. What do I do? What do people need? How do I show up in a way that's most effective? And that's really the essence of the self as instrument idea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So self as instrument, maybe, maybe you can define, define this for us. Yeah. So I uh, want to say at the outset, there are two main labels for this body of work that's existed over time. The first is use of self and the second is self as instrument. So to me, they're synonymous terms. So you might hear me refer uh, to the same concept using different language, or you okay. might come across literature that would refer to it different ways. Okay. But essentially, the simplest definition is the conscious use of one's whole self in a helping relationship for effectiveness. Hmm. Why does this matter to, say, a leader or a manager? So that is a great question. And there are a bunch of, uh, of, of um, reasons why and, and, and dimensions to explore. But certainly at this point, I want to make sure that, that things are pretty straightforward um, and, and clear, at least as we begin the conversation. The first is that a lot of help that people look to offer is just not very helpful. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure everybody has had that experience of meeting with a therapist, working uh, with a coach, uh, seeing a doctor, and walking mm -hmm. away feeling like, I don't know what that person was doing. I'm not sure what that person was thinking. I'm mm -hmm. not sure that person even knew I was in the room. Mm -hmm. Yet they were dispensing advice. They were giving me instructions. They were asking me a thousand questions, and it totally felt disconnected. From, what from I me, did. yes, yeah. So one, people who are in helping relationships, I think have an obligation and a duty to make sure that the help they're offering is ultimately helpful. Mm -hmm. would, you, would you consider managers and leaders to be those in helping relationships? Well, definitely, definitely. I mean, I, I think, you know, first off, there are just entire vast industries of people who are directly in helping relationships. You know, mm -hmm. we talk about, you know, healthcare and, uh, you know, people who work in psychology, mental health, uh, other forms of healthcare, coaches. And then I think leaders um, in organizations, whether it's, you know, direct help or sometimes just indirect help and service for people, play a crucial role in supporting other people. Mm -hmm. in achieving large, big picture corporate objectives or business objectives, and mm -hmm. then also helping to support people in developing themselves and advancing in their careers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I hear a lot of my clients talking about, um, I just want to help this person. Yep. And sometimes it's, I just want to help this person to execute on their role. And that's kind of, um, that's, 
I don't know, it's, it's, um, it's what you do when you're running out of time is you try to help someone execute on their role. But then there's the kind of leadership and management that is long-term uh, development of, a, of an individual uh, that is the one that pays off the most by far. And, and that kind of help is really, really different because it's not trying to help someone get it done or do it for them or, or um, show them how. It is helping them to uncover uh, their own inner resources and resourcefulness and their own creativity and helping them to learn to navigate themselves. Maybe it's helping maybe in your language. I wonder if uh, that kind of a coaching manager, leader, parent, teacher is, is actually helping others to get in touch with themselves as an instrument. Well, totally, totally. That's, that's exactly right. And, and so just to build on that a little bit, if I'm going to be in a relationship of helping someone who's important to me, important on a personal level or professional level, I have to be a clean instrument mm -hmm. in order to do that work, in order to actually be helpful and deliver on that intention. And the reality is that a lot of people in helping roles are not clear and clean in terms of how they show up. Okay, so it, there could be a, I could be a dirty instrument, essentially. Exactly, exactly. And is that if it's, an, I'm, it's the non-conscious use of myself? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. I know, I mean, I'll be the first to admit that I've, you know, packed five back-to-back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back coaching calls in a day. By the fifth call, I'm bringing everything from the first four calls into the experience, <laughs> and I'm not really listening to what the person's saying and I'm struggling to remember if the issue is from the person I'm talking to or three calls before or mm -hmm. what in the world's going on. That's not helpful. And I'm not really showing up clean and clear in that state. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and so if, if the definition of this is it's the conscious use of one's whole being, I'd like to ask our listeners, you know, how consciously are you using your beingness, not just doing your role, but using your beingness, your whole being, when you execute on your role? Whether that's at work or at home or out in the world or in your creative life, I think it's, we, can, we can kind of throw ourselves around and throw ourselves into stuff without consciously using our whole being or not using the whole being and leaving some parts out. Exactly. And so what's really essential that I wanna to add to the conversation right now is that part of the reason this is such a tricky and challenging concept for a lot of people when doing this sort of exploration, and I can tell more stories later about my own experiences with this, is that it requires the ability or at least the openness to see the seer to see the seer, the yes, one who sees. Exactly, exactly. So when I am fully into an experience, it's hard for me to see how I'm showing up and it's difficult for me to know what I'm doing, uh, and what my choices are uh, compared to what the other options are literally while I'm in the moment. Mm -hmm. So this exploration is about taking a step out of being in the moment operating you know fully while being plugged in and then understanding what that is and how i'm showing up and what my choices are and how i could be doing that better or differently down the road this is such a great reason why we do check-ins yes it's a practice of this isn't it taking stock of who am i being right now as i as i arrive that's exactly yeah. right that's right. What am I bringing into this experience? Yeah. Is there anything from earlier in the day is, you know, and now, right, we're all dealing with a very challenging and unprecedented time in our lives and world history. I don't think we can help but bring some of those thoughts, feelings, concerns into the experience. Mm -hmm. We want to do that in a way that is helpful and additive to the experience. Or do we want to do it in a way that's muddled, confusing, and disorganized? Mm. Yeah. yeah. This is a really an essential time to be as conscious 
and integrated as possible. Hmm. To be as conscious and integrated as possible. Can you, can you give us some examples of different ways it might look if we were not being conscious, integrated, whole, using ourselves intentionally? Yeah, you know, certainly. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to share even some recent experiences of doing coaching work with people. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, so uh, the, I'm going to rewind the tape here to about five weeks ago. And so we're, we're maybe into uh, the maybe the, the first full week or maybe it was the second week uh, of um, the, you know, the, the shelter at home uh, situation that we're in and the challenges that were, were going on. And I, you know, woke up inspired one day and said that, uh, you know, my greatest um, uh, gift right now to my clients is to just like, let them process this experience. I want to just like, shut down the business talk and let go of the agenda and all the different trappings that I typically bring to my coaching work. Mm. And I just want to like, be there on a human level for people. So I remember I, I stepped into the first call and I was like, you know, I was feeling almost like uh, the sense of heroism, right? Like mm. I'm, I'm here, I'm ready to be what you need me to be. I'm ready to just, you know, provide some human support at this point. So I got into my first call and I said, hey, let's get started. Um, I, I feel very passionate at this point that I've got a calling and that I want to bring that calling into our work together. So let's take our agenda. Let's throw that out of the window. I don't want to worry about the notes from the last call. I don't want to follow up on action items. I just want to be here for you. And there was this long pause. And my thought at that pause was like, wow, I just really struck a nerve and <laughs> incredible. And like, I, I can't believe what I've just done here. This is like my moment of truth or something. I've just gone to the next level of my coaching work. Uh. And, and, you know, after maybe 10 or 12 seconds, uh, the, the client replied like, oh, uh, I was actually hoping we could follow up on the action items from the last call <laughs> and all this chaos and craziness. Like I need something stable to hold on to. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, Oh, whoops. <laughs> <laughs> sounds like I'm putting my agenda ahead of the client's needs. Sounds yes. like I'm really into being a superhero today for my reasons and mm -hmm. not for the client's. Now, none of that was done with any maliciousness or ill will or desire to, you know, confuse anybody. But at the same time, I was not being very helpful because I didn't even bother to discover what the client was looking for. I projected my own desires onto their needs. What was, th that's such a, that's such an awesome story. Uh, you know, I, I'm thinking about <laughs> times where you know as parents I think my husband and I have both done this of trying to quote help a child I'm trying to help you and you're just this mo helping monster and like the child is just sad and frustrated and terrified and and feels judged and is like why are you freaking out on me so much I'm trying I'm to help me. you that's right <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah, because we do get really attached to this idea we can be helpful. That's and that's a very um, intoxicating idea for for many of us. And just to connect this to some of the other content that's foundational to this podcast, that's when we're going into hero mode, and we're trying to avoid our own feelings by fixing and saving and solving and helping. And this is actually a way that we get temporary relief from our own beingness. And we call this being on the drama triangle. It's one of the, one of the three flavors of being on the drama triangle. We could be in victim mode. We could be in a villain mode where we're blaming, or we could be in this hero mode, which is so common. And um, it's really good to pay attention to that. But I wonder, you know, you got this, luckily you, you had a relationship, you'd established a relationship with your clients where you were able to get that feedback clearly. And it sounds like in a very um, actually supportive way of you getting back on track with attuning to their needs. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering if you didn't know them uh, or let's say that 
you are a manager and you've got a brand new employee or one who's shy and doesn't want to speak up, when would you know that you had gone off track? And, and was there some moment where now you're tracing back, you can remember when you started going off track? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. Um, it's, a, it's a tough one to answer uh, with any kind of clarity or definition uh, because, um, because if the individual, so I, I, I guess the, the, the point of this is I think it's incumbent on people who are in leadership or primary helping roles, so it can include coaches and therapists and, you know, all, all of those sorts of folks, to uh, ensure that there's a regular discipline around self-inquiry and check-ins with other people about the effectiveness of any sort of leadership, managerial, or helping work. Mm -hmm. Because if I didn't receive uh, that uh, response uh, from my client, uh, you know, I'm not sure I would uh, have ever known that. Mm -hmm. And the person might have even, you know, like, scale back the engagement or let me go or, you know, something mm -hmm. like that. And, you know, short of me directly asking and hoping that they were candid with me, mm -hmm. uh, it would be very uh, difficult to know. Um, I would also say that 360s, just as a practical tool, are often really great ways of understanding the efficacy of uh, leadership and helpfulness because mm -hmm. uh, they give, uh, you know, a myriad of people, an array of people, a chance to provide uh, structured feedback uh, about the impact of work. So, so this, is a three, this is a 360 degree review process you're talking about where you get exactly. feedback and yeah, usually yeah. from a, a coach would gather that feedback for you or you do it anonymously some way or interviews. Yep. Right. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Very helpful and, and, and challenging to get feedback um, sometimes when you don't set it up ahead of time and uh, it, always it, important. It, it is. It is. But, but the other thing, too, is like I or anyone else in that sort of role has to be open to that and has to see themselves or see him or herself as the primary instrument of help. And you know, this is also as opposed to what? Yeah. So this is a this is a really key point. I'm, I'm glad it came up in the conversation right now because it's uh, it's kind of a, a philosophical notion. But to me. Uh, one that is, uh, is really the most helpful uh, or important to glean from this. And, and that is in a helping relationship, I believe it is the individual who exists as the primary instrument of the work. Not the content, not the mm. exercises, not the materials, and not even the process steps. Hmm. So this is part, and I can maybe share more of the history of, of the exploration of this a little bit later in our conversation, but this is a statement to make, and I know not everyone agrees with it, but both my personal experience and my study of this topic really do underscore that point. Hmm. So what I have learned through my coaching, um, two decades of coaching work, is that most people are out there looking for an external tool or system mm -hmm. to make them a great coach. Such as, um, Such as a frameworks or program. trainings. Exactly, yeah. like buying into a system. There are lots of kind of like, you know, franchisees types of models and programs that people can buy into and resell or bring into their process. There are personality profile instruments. Um, you know, I think all or most of which are really good and useful and meaningful. Um, there are just coaching tools and resources that almost anybody could find just doing a basic search of questions mm -hmm. to ask and processes to deploy. Mm -hmm. And my experience have, have said, my experiences have told me that someone can go gain all of that, get a coaching certification um, spend time shadowing masters and doing this work and be a terrible coach. Yeah. Now it doesn't mean the material's not good. It doesn't mean that the mentors and resources uh, aren't wise or knowledgeable, but it means that the external material is really secondary to the individual. Mm -hmm. So in my case, I have found that unless I know how to show up, engage 
in intimacy and connection, push forward in a way that I think is helpful and additive to the client, be open to feedback and evolve and iterate as I go. It doesn't matter what personality profile I use. It doesn't matter what question set I deploy and it doesn't matter how much I charge or don't charge in my work. It starts with me and everything that's going to work or not work is going to be because of the choices I make in terms of how to deploy myself as a resource. Oof. This is, um, this is probably some of the best advice I've ever heard. This, you know, I think we've all had the experience of being, um, I don't know, model humped of, you know, a manager will come at you with like 16 ways to do your OKRs and, and like, this is supposed to align us and, and yet they're not aligned. And so, and so we're not aligned and, you know, in parenting, you can get really busy trying to apply a bunch of models. I remember even in dating, you know, I would, I read, I read a couple dating books and I was like, I'm going to live this out to the, you know, to the letter. And I was really into the rules. And then it was men are from, when, when are from Venus, men are from Mars, you know, things like that. we get so attached because we're scared of what if actually at the end of the day, my impact is based on me, not on, there's no tool at the end of the day that can actually get me away from that fundamental reality. Even in acting, I, I got really caught up in the, the specific techniques of method acting and theory. And it divorced me from my own, like in the moment, present aliveness. Yes. That was the thing that made me a good actress. That's and right. it, I killed it. I killed, I killed that piece of my expression by getting all attached to the models. And I have so, you know, a lot of people reach out to us, David, um, you know, for mentorship or advice. How can I, how can I be a coach? How can I follow after you? Or what advice would you have for me in this turnaround situation I'm working on with my startup? And um, it is so much of that, like grasping for what's the one, can I write down three steps, three things, three books to buy that are going to give me the answers, which isn't to say that there's not really good guidance in those books. Of course. But it, you can feel it when, when you're being model humped feels really different from when there is a, a fully present being whose intention is to be attuned with you and is applying their knowledge as a piece of who they are as a whole person. Yes. Yes. Such a difference. So I, as you know, I lead a coach training program through evolution. Yeah. And I've done this, you know, a handful of times now with some different cohort groups. And we inevitably uh, and invariably hit this challenge a few weeks in. So when people sign up and I'm talking about coaching and the ability to be effective and how to do all that. Um, you know, I talk about self as instrument and most people are like, yeah, 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 it sounds good. And, and, and then we move to the place where they're going to start actually coaching people. And I give them a, a list of five questions and say, okay, here, go coach. And, you know, typically at least half the class sends me these like five alarm messages saying, I don't know what I'm doing. You're not teaching me how to coach. You're not giving me the resources I need to be. I have no idea what I'm doing. This is overwhelming. I can't believe I'm paying money for this. What in the world is wrong with you? Don't you know it? And I sort of, you know, it takes me to remain grounded in those circumstances and not be too reactive to it. Mm -hmm. But I normally respond by saying, well, do you know how to have a conversation with someone? Mm -hmm. Do you know how to ask them how they're doing? Do you know how to ask them what they need help with? And they'll, you know, they sort of 
you know, get frustrated even by those simplistic questions and they'll say, yes, yes. And I say, well, guess what? You know how to begin. Yeah. Coaching is two humans talking. Mm -hmm. Focus on two humans talking and go from there. And then a couple of sessions in, they gain some confidence and start to feel more at ease in the process and have their own voice in the experience. Yeah. Not my voice or someone who wrote a book's voice coming through them. And they know very early on how to do good coaching work. And then the materials and the resources and the instruments all rest on top of that platform of individual strength mm. and connection and they work. Mm -hmm. But what they want from the beginning is the formula and the paint by numbers instructions. And that's completely the card before the horse. Completely. And if you, if you have that too early, then you actually hide behind it and you never get to find out who you are as a coach and it is that uncomfortable space, that uncomfortable empty space that you need to sit in where you really have nothing to rely on aside from I'm going to be as attuned as I possibly can and as present as I possibly can and see how I can be helpful. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly right. So a lot of this uh, thing about emptiness and spaciousness is reminding me of T, the, form, the T group format. Yes. And you, you've done a T group, haven't you? I have. I yeah. have. That was one of my first uh, direct experiences with this concept of self as instrument. And it's not a tea party. Like Arrow wants to throw a, a tea party. It's not that. It's <laughs> what is a T group? Not the T group I went to, at least. Uh, so uh, yeah, so quick little little bit of quick history about the field of organization development. Okay. So that's what I studied. That was uh, where I went. I went to graduate school in an OD program. OD was really started by a group of researchers who got out of the lab coats and into an interactive process with a group of people to uh, not only talk about what they were discussing. Uh, but to discuss and, and, and uh, examine how they were discussing mm. what the topic was. Not just what so, they were discussing, but how they were discussing it. How are we doing what we're doing? It's called like double loop learning is the technical term for that. So ever since that first T group formed in the late 40s, uh, it's been uh, a uh, really a defining uh, part and structure in the uh, OD world. And I think it's maybe less in vogue now than it was a number of years ago, but I, I certainly know in a lot of training programs, people end up in T-groups. So uh, I'm, I'm going to take you to, uh, I think it was maybe our third uh, session in, um, in my grad school program. Uh, we got divided into uh, groups of, I think, about seven. We had a, a faculty facilitator, and we uh, were then you know, put into these separate rooms to begin our T group process. And none of us really knew what this was and there wasn't much uh, explanation at all given to us. So we all sat down, we're arrayed, you know, like around the sofas and love seats and we're all sitting there, you know, nervous and curious and a little bit of excited. And uh, we're, we're kind of waiting for the whole thing to start and our faculty uh, member uh, like looks around and you know kind of says welcome uh, leans forward I remember this distinctly claps his hands and says begin <laughs> and you know we're we're all like uh, yeah be begin what you no instructions at this point you're just sitting he, in a room with strangers yeah oh. I mean I knew these people a little bit but uh -huh. you know but we certainly didn't have a lot of deep relationships yet and so, you know, a bunch of us said, begin what? And he's saying, begin, you know, and it was <sighs> like, just, you know, kind of refusing to budge off that position. So fast forward about 15 minutes, uh, you know, a, a handful of us are like kind of trying to wrangle the process and introduce a format and a structure. And then a couple of other people are resisting that process and pushing back. <laughs> and fast forward about another hour 
Uh, sounds like well, a lot of sounds like a lot of executive team meetings actually. <laughs> <laughs> it gets worse. <laughs> so uh, fast forward about another hour, hour and a half. Certain people, including me, are screaming. <laughs> I remember <laughs> punching a pillow, like demonstrating like you know visceral frustration and even anger. Other people are checked out. Somebody went to the bathroom. So, okay, so this lasted for three days. Oh. Right? Now, not all those experiences weren't consistent for three days, but this ambiguous, unarticulated vacuum of instructions kind of experience lasted for three days. I, I can just, he, I, can, I can picture some of our listeners right now who've been dedicated, loyal listeners up to this point, being like, this is a bunch of baloney. This is pointless. There's no material here. How is this useful? So <laughs> I thought going. all of that and more. Uh, yes. in my experience of being of being in that. So when you get to the very end, we had this amazing experience. There was, you know, I mean, just some of the deepest connections I'd ever made. Intimacy huh. abounded. Personal learnings everywhere. But of course, right? everyone wants to know what's the point of doing that? Like what, what, what's the value of, n you know, no clear instruction? What's the, 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 uh, the value of massive ambiguity? Mm -hmm. And the point was, who are you when everything around you is stripped away? Mm. Who are you when there is no context? Who are you in total ambiguity? Whoa. And what, you know, I was describing were the, like, you know, almost like demonic reactions that people had to no clues, to no context, to no direction. So angry. Angry, confusing, terrifying, hilarious at times, inspirational in moments. But the point is, most of us look to the environment to tell us who to be and what to do and how to show up. And when that's taken away, it's overwhelming. But what I would say is that help in a human system has no clear definition. People are not simplistic organisms. They're multifaceted and multidimensional. So how in the world could I show up with a prescribed method for being helpful? Mm. I need to get into the ambiguity. I need to play in the unknown. I need to mm. go with the flow and experience of what's in front of me mm. in order to do that. But I cannot effectively do that work unless I've essentially looked into the abyss and know and, and realize who I am in that emptiness. <sighs> And so what I have taken away and what's been helpful for me um, in this time uh, of, of challenge and confusion and unprecedented restrictions that we're all dealing with are some memories back to the tea group. Hmm. Like, I don't know about you. I didn't get a pamphlet that said, here's how to do coaching work in a pandemic. Yeah. yeah I don't know. <laughs> Does anyone have one of those? I'd, I'd, I'd like to see it, but I don't know what that is. And it really changed day by day. It felt like, you know, there, there were patterns, but what was needed was it evolved so quickly, which is why I've been doing the practice of naming the date um, every time we record, because I know tomorrow's different. We didn't know it. And, you know, that first week, it was so gnarly. And I remember myself just there was a point where suddenly, I don't know, a switch got flicked and I was in rabid news consumption mode and trying to piece together, what do I need to know right now to be prepared for what's ahead? And the irony of it is the thing I was most sure of is I can't really trust anyone's advice on this topic. 
the only thing that we all know is that we don't understand what's going on right now. We don't know what we're dealing with. We don't know the nature of this virus. We don't, even then at that point, we didn't even fully know how it was communicated. We probably still don't know um, entirely. I don't know how I'm going to feed my family. Are we going to run out of food here? Is the market going to run out of food? Are they going to And there were those points of just utter breakdown for me and yeah. feeling like is everything um, that I've built and I was really thinking a lot about this show, you know, is that going to go away because I'm, and, and was, so, and like, you know, talk about g- grasping, <laughs> grasping at straws when homeschool began, you know, it was like, I, I kept the kids home from school on Friday the 13th. I just chose, I was like, this is not feeling good. I don't want to send them. The, then that afternoon, the school called, we're not going back to school. That Monday was the first day of quote homeschool, but there was nothing. It was like, here's some handouts that you had to download, but it was all out of order. And I organized this really complex school day with my kids, all these post-its and all the different activities. And we were doing our morning exercises and there was like Google timer was going off and you should have seen it. I mean, you'd, you'd laugh. You'd laugh at how hard I was making it for myself and everybody else. Mm-hmm. I was really, um, but I was, I was fully committed. Like I'm going to, but then by the end of that day, I was, I hate to admit it. I was a monster. Mm-hmm. I was so frustrated with my kids, not letting me teach them. <laughs> Let me help you. That's right. That's right. And now I mean, we've all learned, but what I found out is the less I do, the better it works. And my son gets up and he goes to his computer and he gets through his work. And the less I mess with him, the better he does with that. And it's just that it's like having him find that his, his self as an instrument here, instead of sitting there waiting for me to be the teacher, which was, was what was happening then. But now he realizes that's not, that's not more fun. I don't want mommy the monster anymore. (laughs) I'm going to be my own teacher now, mom. So that's, uh, I want to chime in here on that story because uh, one, it sounds like a story. Well, I know it's a story that uh, is played out in our family and, you know, in in some similar ways with, you know, this radical new format to life and trying to, you know, push forward with, uh, you know, a way to do it, realize that it hasn't worked and and then to, to pivot from there. Um, but it's also, you know, even if we, we move out of the context of, of today, it's an experience that people have all the time uh, when they're trying to accomplish something meaningful is, is showing up a certain way and then getting a set of results. And I think what you just modeled in that story was the ability to step back from a situation and observe what, how you were showing up, what the reaction was. Uh, from uh, people and the other people involved, and then to really ask yourself, is this deter- Is this helpful? Is this helpful mm-hmm. help? Is this the type of work that um, I want to continue doing? And as maybe straightforward as this process sounds uh, right now in our conversation, my experience is most people really struggle to engage even that kind of minimal amount of self-examination in an experience. Mm-hmm. And so what they do is they try harder, right? So instead of like, you know, the sort of mini monster becomes a bigger monster. Mm -hmm. And when that doesn't happen, then it's somebody else's fault. And Mm -hmm. it's, or I need to find a new book on how to be a better monster or Mm -hmm. something similar to that. But the ability to know that like how you show up is playing a critical role in how others are experiencing those efforts Mm -hmm. and how they relate to the ultimate results is a gigantic, gigantic gift, gift to you, gift to others. Yeah. I I know that you have a lot more um, to teach on this subject. And we've, we've have a lot of leaders who listen to this show who are really committed to conscious leadership. And this is such an important piece of it. Um, I, I know that you can give some concrete uh, details about what you need to be competent in, how to seek that competency, uh, what are the kind of pitfalls? Would you be willing to to put some of that material together as a training to offer our listeners, David? Of course, of course. Very happy to do that. Um, Great. I've got I've definitely got some materials and some good thinking on that. 
topic and would be happy to make it available. And listeners, you can get David's workbook at keneal.com slash podcast, where you can find many other free resources as well. But David, before you go, I wonder if you could give some direct advice, some tips uh, for those who want to maximize self as instrument and really come in as a clean instrument in their helping. Absolutely, Keneal. So three things really stand out to me. Uh, and that I've been looking to practice uh, over the course of the last six weeks. The first is to reorient to purpose. Hmm. So when the environment is scrambled and we don't really know what's up and what's down and what to do and how to show up, looking within and remembering who I am, what I'm here to do and why it's important is an incredible grounding experience that I think is helpful all the time, but especially in a moment like this. I'm mm -hmm. spending a lot of time reviewing things I already know because I need to embody them mm. in this chaotic time. The second is to be fanatical about self-care. Uh, I don't know if everyone out there is like me, but I've got quite a plan I've developed to do this and a shaky execution track record with it, I am working so hard now to ensure that I'm putting my own oxygen mask on first before helping others mm -hmm. and remembering that I cannot pour from an empty cup. So I have to have my cup filled first mm -hmm. if I'm going to be a resource to anyone else. My journaling, my exercise, my meditation, those really have to be a top priority in this time. Mm -hmm. And then the third, and this goes back to the story I was telling earlier about engaging with my client and wanting to be a superhero, is I think it's critical now to prioritize inquiry over advocacy. Mm -hmm. I need to spend more time asking people what it's like to be them right now and what they truly need to be supported rather than assuming it's one thing or another, uh, or even worse, projecting my own needs and desires onto theirs. So I'm spending a lot of time asking questions and less time giving direct advice. Hmm. That's great advice. <laughs> and, and what's coming up for me is that I want to do that for myself as well. I want to be in that space of asking myself questions about what I need rather than shooting on myself and giving myself a bunch of advice and judgment of what my morning routine needs to look like or how much exercise I should be getting or any host of things I could easily start judging myself on right now. So I love that. Thank you, David. Absolutely. And we'll, we will include a lot of deeper learning material for you in a workbook that David has provided. Again, that's at Keneal.com slash podcast, and that is a free resource for you. So please go and check that out. Uh, David, it's been so amazing having you here today. Um, our listeners are going to go to Keneal.com slash podcast to access the materials that you're offering. Thank you so much. If they want to get in touch with you directly, what's the best way to do that? Yeah, I think the best way is uh, through email at uh, david at evolution.team. Great. And we will post that in the show notes as well at keneal.com slash podcast. Listeners, I hope that you have found some appreciation for yourself today in taking some space to show up for something that really wants your momentum. And that is the development and examination of you. And in this crazy time, um, if you can be confronted with nothing else but who you are at your essence, then you have made the most of this time. And David, thank you for teaching us about why that uncomfortability of this time is actually of service to us. Uh, listeners, looking forward to hearing from you, and we'll see you next week.